Hello everyone. Welcome to another session of biotechnology. We have uh, Dr. Rajiv Datar, CEO of DNX Bio uh, from San Diego, California. Uh, welcome Rajiv Thank you. Uh, to biotechnology. Rajiv graduated from the University of Pune, then did his PhD from the Royal Institute of Technology, Stockholm, and then postdoc at Professors Cooney and Wang at MIT. He has been associated with biotechnology from the days of gro human growth hormone and was involved with the development of the first four recombinant products of the world. He has worked in companies like Alpha Laval, Pharmacia, Paul, uh, before embarking on his entrepreneurship career with uh, co-founding a few companies, including DNX Biopharmaceuticals in 2015, to focus on a very, very important area called rare disease drug development. So welcome, Rajiv. Welcome to Biotechnology. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you. Happy welcome. to be here. So Rajiv, before we kick it off, could you also say a few comments about your career and how it sort of evolved till date before we get into rare diseases? Yeah, sure, Prabhu. I've been happy, we'd be happy to do that. Um, I began as a, as a pure scientist with a pure science background, chemistry, biochemistry, and I got bored and I just wanted to do chemical engineering. So mm -hmm. I switched to chemical and biochemical engineering, which then led me to bioprocessing and bioprocess technologies. At that time, I was in Sweden working for Alpha Law and Pharmacia. So I got exposed to the first few uh, biotech products that were made, recombinant biotech products, mm -hmm. which included uh, growth hormone for Pharmacia, insulin for Lily, and TPA for Genentech. And then also bovine growth hormone for Monsanto. Oh. And that then uh, also led me to have enough experience on both the equipment side, having worked for a company like Alpha Laval, and the product side uh, on, the, on the products that we worked on. Wonderful, that's fantastic. So Rajiv, before, I mean, as we've discussed about these, uh, we know each other for quite a while on this on your journey onto rare diseases. Why did you get into rare diseases? Uh, Prabhupada, there were a couple of different reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, at one level, there's a personal reason, uh, and then there was of course, of course, the bio entrepreneurship reason mm -hmm. or the reasons for getting into that. On the personal level, uh, my daughter has a little situation in the right hand, mm -hmm. uh, which is related to inflammation. So I got I very see. interested in inflammation I to see. begin with. Mm -hmm. On the other side, as an entrepreneur, you're always looking out for potential new avenues to, uh, to, uh, to, yep. to develop new products. And these two kind of seem to gel, and that's how I got thinking about getting into the rare disease segment in, uh, in biotechnology. It's a fantastic reason to be in it. So Rajiv, if we were to take this discussion a little forward, what in your opinion would you define, I mean, what does the world define for our audience and everyone as a orphan disease or a rare disease? How would you define it in that sense? Um, orphan diseases, at least in the US context, are defined with a patient population where the patient population is less than 200,000. I see. And uh, there are roughly somewhere between 6,000, 7,000 known rare diseases, True. which has a genetic uh, origin. And I think today, barely 600, 700 uh, solutions have been offered. Mm -hmm. So there's a vast potential for right. smaller companies, by entrepreneurial by the companies to actually explore this area. Uh, absolutely, I mean, this is a fantastic, I mean, it looks as a very interesting area where there's a significant opportunity and definitely a huge relevance for the community, especially if someone is suffering from a rare disease where a drug is sort of not available. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good, place to start from. And w uh, shifting gears a little, in terms of, but traditionally big pharma has not really been interested in rare diseases. Is that a view that you would also hold right now in terms of how the progress has been made? Yeah, uh, yes, I do in fact, because the what happens is that um, big pharma ha is, is promising their analysts billion dollar drugs. Right. And rare diseases, some of them do actually reach, reach a billion dollars, but not all of them. Since True. the patient population is so high, the drug prices can get ridiculously high, and we've seen that in the last year play out. So what Big Pharma likes to do is that they like to allow smaller entrepreneurial companies like DNX to actually bring the products up to a phase two. Mm -hmm. And at that point, typically, that's an inflection point where the, where the Big Pharma kind of signs a merger and acquisition deal or an, or an asset acquisition or an li asset license uh, and then they pick it up for much larger scale distribution because uh, because because the patient populations are global right. and the small numbers in in uh, you know spread out throughout the world. You bring a very interesting perspective is that the journey of a rare drug disease development. One of the things which I somehow get very curious is a with the patient population low. What is the incidence that you will be able to fill your clinical trial? Is do and how is the regulatory landscape looking at that? 
The, that, that is a concern, especially to find patients. Yeah. But you have a lot of CROs, contract research organizations, both in, um, in US and Europe, where they maintain databases. Mm -hmm. I think I believe that if, I'm, if I have this correct, that every country in the, U in the EU maintains the database of uh, registers for different rare diseases. Mm -hmm. So it, you, the CROs play a very important role because if you go and give them a contract to do a, uh, the clinical trial, right. they have access to the patients. And would you be, and from the regulatory point of view, coming back to that, would you have to then follow the same regulatory pathway that uh, you think for traditionally drugs like a phase one, phase two, and a phase three? Or do you think there could be some sort of uh, fast tracking that could be done or is done? There is fast tracking, mm -hmm. and that's one of the incentives to get into the into the uh, into the rare disease segment. Um, DNX particularly is focused on pediatric rare diseases. Mm -hmm. So what happens there is that you know you first file a um, once you show there's a medically plausible solution, then at least at the FDA you can you can file an what's called an ODA, an orphan drug application. Right. That really kicks off the whole process, and then you get if you're successful you get fast track breakthrough. Uh, status, mm -hmm. which then propels you into a phase one. But you still have to go to the phase one, phase two, depending on how rare the disease is. True. And typically, what would the size of these trials be? Five patients, 10 patients, 15 patients, or would it be a little larger than that? It depends on the on the genetic disease. It depends on the rare disease. I uh, see. There, have been, there have been cases where uh, products have been approved based on mm -hmm. five patient trials, and but most commonly, roughly 20 to 40 I is see. what one would one would target. Fantastic. So now coming to DNX Bio, it's very interesting that you mentioned your progress. So I think a lot of our viewers would be very interested in your journey uh, till date into rare diseases and, I mean, as you've explained, and uh, sort of starting DNX Bio and seeing how and where to get everything connected. So how was that journey? Sure. Um, you know, as, as, I, as I related a few minutes ago, the DNX got into this or I got into this because of a personal connection. Uh, but also along the way, uh, we intend to remain a virtual company. Mm -hmm. So we have two lead molecules, uh, lead one, lead two. And our game plan essentially is to stay very small, but to outsource the development of the molecules. And sure. as you know, one of the molecules we have worked with you at Primus yes. to, you know, to begin the process of development. Um, and the other one is actually in the process of trying to do a deal uh, with a large company to take it further. Um, our focus, as I said, initially was inflammation. And if you look at the inflammation spectrum, it goes from auto-inflammatory auto diseases, which are pediatric rare diseases, all the way through to cardiovascular and to uh, cancer. Now, yeah. those are large markets. As a small company, we have no way to get into a cancer clinical trial. True. So our focus is what's called a partial orphan strategy, where we begin developing the, the data in the mm -hmm. orphan disease, and then move on to, and then do partnering license uh, opportunities in the bigger segments. Also, when we come to your portfolio strategy, you have also adapted certain technologies that are not often found or is getting more popular nowadays. I mean, it's very interesting. While I absolutely understand the need to do it, it would be interesting for our viewers of biotechnology to understand the kind of strategy that you are taking in for your portfolio as well. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, DNX does not intend to go after an trying to uncover novel targets. Mm -hmm. That's far too time consuming. So our lead one actually is a product already in the market. Mm -hmm. But what we've been able to do, it, uh, that one has a very short half-life. So what we've been able to do is to bring in some, uh, an extension technology that does two things. It extends the half-life and it alters the efficacy. In fact, it improves the efficacy, uh, which is a paradox because some of the other techno extension technologies actually drop the efficacy right. dramatically. So we're very excited about, about that possibility. And you know, we hope that the, pre the preclinical data looks very good. You know, we hope that you know, it will perform the same in clinical trials as well. I really hope so too because uh, from the kind of data that you, you have been sharing with us, I think it's uh, very exciting to see how you've been able to extend and alter both the efficacy and the half-life. Yes. And it's all sort of very interesting and, and tunable, I believe. That's yeah. what one of the things that I think you've been also focusing on is Yes, it is, it is tunable, and we're surprised. You can you, almost down to few few hundred amino acids at a time. You, know, mm. you can actually alter the. We can predict a priori what the uh, half life, the, dis, the in designed in half life that we want it to be. For potential other entrepreneurs who are sort of thinking of getting into these rare diseases, what would be the sort of one, two, three uh, lessons that you've learned about raising funds, or you know, 
getting into it and getting, you know, doing the hard ground work, yeah. uh, what would you be advising them primarily on the first one, two, three? Um, raising, it depends on what area you're in. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, as I said, our lead one is already a molecule in the market, mm -hmm. which we've adapted. Our lead two has never seen the market. Right. So we'll have, uh, the reason we began with this strategy is that because the lead one is a known molecule, we anticipated an easier right. flow into a clinical trial. Uh, because the lead two has never seen a market at all. Uh, but it actually has turned out to be just the opposite. So <laughs> it's, been, it's been tough trying to raise money. Right. Uh, there are certain quote unquote sexy sectors, uh, hot molecules, which garner a lot of interest from, um, from a venture capitalists. Right. Uh, but they're all novel targets, typically small mm -hmm. molecule. But, mm -hmm. but it's, been, it's, been, it's a lot of grunt work. Uh, and it's sheer, it's sheer persistence and chasing VCs all day long, which, you know, <laughs> and, and So you would say to sort of the new entrepreneurs out there, it's hard work. Incredibly hard work. Incredibly hard work. And so you must really believe in the cause. Yeah. Uh, it's a lot of persistence in terms of chasing the venture capitalist, getting them to listen to you. Yeah. And, you know, getting part of their mind share because they're also looking at, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people are bombarding them with various ideas. So it's about how you get that mind share from them. Yeah. No, fantastic. A apart from, say, getting the work done and getting the finance put into, do you foresee any other major roadblock that you see down the, uh, down the road coming up? Or you, if you get funding, that should have enable and open up more of your doors? Uh, the funding does. Funding plays a very important role. Um, it certainly opens uh, doors. Uh, as I said uh, early on, um, we I'm not sure whether we want to be a fully integrated company as yet, we're too early. Mm -hmm. uh, but given the opportunity, we would like to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly, uh, the partial orphan strategy and the ability to work with larger pharma companies that want to get into this space, but don't want to, but want to get into this space at a later point in time, is certainly helpful. So our, our strategy has been two-pronged, to chase VCs at, at, at one level, but also talk to large pharma who have potential interest in this, you know, in, in the disease segments that we are uh, uh, trying to focus our development. Uh, molecules to develop. Do you think that some of this uh, work that you're doing in the United States and you would also sort of overflow into com uh, countries like India and other areas which are still walking up the drug discovery and development platforms and trying to understand, do you think that there would be a place for that as well here? Uh, I think there is. Uh, of course, rare diseases as an, un as an understanding is a much more um, at a higher level mm -hmm. than in, in US and, uh, and Europe, and more so in U US because it, it commands prices that other countries are not able to or don't want to sustain, uh, sure. given their own internal policies for reimbursement. Um, in the case of Indi countries like India and China, uh, there have been initial uh, moves, mm -hmm. um, like there's an India uh, Orphan Drug Alliance. They've teamed up with the US Orphan mm -hmm. Drug Alliances to actually make orphan drugs a um, bring it into more prominence in the Indian context. The Chinese are doing the same thing. Right. And these are two big markets that you know, one would like to focus on. And on that point, thank you very much, Rajiv. It's been absolutely a pleasure having you here. Thank you to our viewers of Biotechnology. Till the next time, uh, for another great talk with another great thought leader. Thank you very much. And Rajiv, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.